so we'll start again. And um, now I'd like to deal more with things that dealing with narrative, in case, or is that what people are interested in? Sure. I can, uh, I improvise everything, so I can improvise whatever you want. Um, so basically the digital video also, you know, it lets you make the abstract kind of things that I showed you a little bit about before. Uh, but in the same way, it lets you change how you approach the whole idea of making a film instead of making a narrative film. I've made, let me see if I can count, let me see. I, I lost track. Um, let's see, where did I start? The digital video starts with London Brief, which is a, a documentary kind of film. Not France de Luge. Those are two films. Okay, the, let me all go down the list. I didn't mean to make this, this, or this. <laughs> <laughs> they just happened, right? This one I made because I had shot a bunch of stuff in Rome and, and, and I knew somebody and television asked me to make it. I don't particularly like this one. I mean, I liked the material that it was made out of, but I didn't like what I had to, I had put music on parts of it to make it palatable for television and for myself I wouldn't have done that. This, again, kind of, I didn't mean to make a film. I did a workshop in India for a month with lower caste and tribal people and way out in the kind of totally non-touristic part of India, very poor part of India, and my students would take me to their family's village each weekend. So I just shot that, and I ended up with a nice film out of that. This film I meant to make, it was made in, uh, well, basically, it was shot in an afternoon. So I think a 70 minute long film shot in the afternoon in a green screen thing like this, which I didn't know how to do, and boy, fixing the green screen was my hard lesson in how to do green screen. <laughs> it took it a day to shoot, and it took like several months to, to edit, because as I didn't know, uh, my green screen was bad. This film was kind of made on purpose, um, which I'll probably show you a little clip of later. This one was made on purpose. This was made on purpose. Passages, no. This was a film shot with some main Italian actresses in a week for $50 feature film. Maybe I'll show you some of it, see what you can do with $50. Uh, and I guess the rest of them were kind of, let's see, Parable was made on purpose. Rant was a documentary about uh, an actor and painter. And I forget what else I made, I don't remember. I guess I didn't make as many, no, let's see. This was made on purpose, but with absolutely zero script. This not on purpose, this not on purpose. And this one was the most recent one shot in Japan. So I want to show you some little, but first I'll talk about how this can change your view of how to go about doing things. Uh, over here, which I want to show you the opening C note, um, was made in Portland, Oregon, and I made, I made a series of films basically about uh, America uh, under the years of Bush, and they're all about, so direct, very indirectly or directly about the war in Iraq, and how that affected things domestically. Um, this is a fiction film, and uh, I started off knowing only it's about a guy who's, been, uh, who's returned from Iraq, he's an Iraq war vet, and that's all I knew. And we started it, and we developed scene by scene. So the scene I'll show you was shot in a cafe, a, uh, this normal coffee house top cafe. I believe oh, I, we were probably in there about 40 minutes, and that included uh, five, people who acted, and me, I was the sole crew. We didn't ask permission to shoot. Portland's kind of laid back place, so perhaps it's a little easier to do it there, but I think I probably could have done it many other places too. And the trick is to move very fast, not make a spectacle of yourself as if you weren't making a film. So I basically probably looked like some guy who was fucking around with his camera. And, you know. So I set the people in their places, uh, we didn't really know what we were going to do, except the, the thread is, uh, well, I won't tell you, you'll see it. Uh, so I, I knew the, 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 the one act that would happen during this, and the rest of it was, I believe I told two of the actors, there was a French guy, and something had happened recently politically in France, there were some demonstrations or something, so I said, go ahead and talk about that, just improvising. 
And uh, basically, we just let it go. And it was, it's shot very fast. It's like about 40 minutes, I was probably in there. I think the scene was, but the last time I showed it, I actually did count shots. Uh, shots. I think it's 20 shots long, and it's probably 20 shots, different shots. It was shot in order, because if you're shooting this way, it really helps to shoot in order to keep it straight in your mind. What, so basically, the shooting and editing simultaneously, so that's what I'm talking about. There's pre-production, production, post-production. Post Once you get the hang of it, you, they all kind of meld together. The pre-production was walking in the cafe. <laughs> the production was shooting the scene. The post-production was the editing that you did while you were shooting, basically. So there wasn't much left after that, aside from to tidy up the sound and clip up the... You know, Working in DV, I found that uh, many times now I'll shoot a scene, I can go home and edit it, uh, you know, rightly after the evening of the day I shoot, and then I can show it to the actors, which works very nice if it's going well. If it's not going well, then you don't want to show it to them because you'll, you'll pull, pull the air out of your balloon, right? So, but if it's going well, then it's good because it makes them feel good. Um, so basically, on this film, I would shoot a scene. I think we spent. Um, I, I, seven to ten days shooting, but a day meant uh, go in the cafe for 40 minutes, and maybe that was the scene for the day. So, by most movie movie work standards, so we worked for an hour. We went there, we shot for whatever, and then we went home and edited. And the editing was very fast because it was all kind of in order to begin with. So maybe you spent an hour pulling it together. So the work day uh, was two or three hours. Now some other scenes. Basically, the whole film was made that way. There's only a handful of scenes, and each one was shot within a couple hours, depending on how many takes. And each one was shot off the top of our heads, right? So, so like here, we know the, the general subject of the film. We know the general form of, uh, of the, the scene, you know, but you might not really know it. Just say, well, you just said this. And so I find it's like writing through the actors, you know. It becomes an active thing between them and me. And so you well begin with this vague thing, and then somebody says something and that makes me think of something or makes them think of something, and you just sort of thread your way through and find the scene while you're shooting it. So step by step, you have one scene the next that leads, leads sort of to the, some other scene, which I hadn't thought of before. So all I knew is I was making a film about a, uh, an Iraq War vet having come home and having the problems he was having, and. Uh, it was built scene by scene. It's the film that preceded it, uh, Homecoming there, was exactly the same thing, maybe a little more extreme, because at least on this one I knew who my lead was, uh, who was the lead in, in the previous film. And on that one, this guy had pestered me on the internet for uh, about, a, you know, I don't know, some years. I met him in a bar in Austin, but I don't remember meeting him in the bar in Austin. <laughs> and, uh, and so he told me, yes, he met me there. And so. Finally, he pestered me enough that I was starting to make this film in Newport, Oregon, and I, I said, okay, I, I give up, you know. But I, but I told him, if you send me a normal industry headshot, I guarantee you I will not work with you, <laughs> because I don't like, th those things are, are so creepy, they're like plastic people. So I said, just send me, a, you know, just have somebody make a snapshot or just email me a snapshot. So he did, and I showed it to this woman who was going to act in it, and we took it. I said, this looks interesting, yeah, okay, so, so we said, yes, he looks interesting. And um, so I said, okay, you pay to get you up here from Austin, and, and if I think you're any good in front of the camera, I'll go ahead and shoot with you, and if I don't, maybe you can help me, and if you're just getting in the way or I don't like you, I'll tell you to get the fuck out of here. And uh, so he bought into that, and uh, we, uh, Proceeded from there, and uh, I picked him up at the airport in Portland and made a mistake driving him back to Newport. It was like two and a half hours, and I ended up on a logging road, which I didn't mean to go on. He got an introduction to certain things about Oregon that most people don't see, like going through you know, a, a clear cut area that looks like you've been in a war. And uh, by the time I got to Newport, I thought, oh, it's kind of interesting. And, then when we started shooting, we put him in little, and about 20% of the way through the film, we realized he was the lead. Right? So he was right to pester me about things for those years on the internet. And then I cast him in the lead. But I, when I started the other film, I didn't know who the lead was. It was a family. It could have been about the father. It could have been about the mother. It could have been about the son. It ended up being about the son and him. 
So I'll put on this. Can I ask you one question? Yeah, sure. Um, it was interesting to me because you have the full back shot, which lasted quite a while, which kind of set the positions yeah. pretty firmly. Yeah. And then when we were in the three separate ones, whenever he'd look to his wife, he'd cut to the right. Yeah. Whereas in the yeah, yeah. other picture, she would be to the left. Correct. Which is, I know, a small continuity. But I, actually, that they were in the same places that they were in the original shot. Really? Yeah. But when you put a camera on each one, like yeah. she should have looked the opposite way to look at him. Uh huh. You know? And he too. I mean, they, they both they were both in position where they should have to be looked like they were looking at each other. Right. They should have looked the opposite way than they did. Yeah. But it's, it increases the visual tension, though, and you realize it actually emphasizes the fact maybe they live in the same house, but they're not on the same wavelength either. Uh, something. I, I mean, it doesn't bother me. I mean, the continuity <laughs> thing. I I read it. The thing is, I didn't think of it when I shot it, right? Okay. which is funny because I'd done a previous film t sometime earlier where I had a mirror shot <coughs> where I had a person in a mirror to look at the person on screen, oh, had, oh, but, the, you know, but they were, she was a professional actress and so I could say, well, I want you to occasionally look at this person, but to you, it's the opposite direction. So I, it wasn't like I wasn't conscious of it, but when okay. I set it up, it was sort of... I didn't, I didn't cohere the image in my head. But I think he's right, that it's probably better mm. yeah. with this dissonance inside the image. Like, mm. like it, it, I think it, it, matches, it matches the mood of the soundtrack perfectly. Because mm. the soundtrack is all, it's all dissonant harmonica. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have two nuts and bolts questions. Yeah. Um, first one of which, um, do you have music composed to you, or do you use open source, or what do you use? Uh, both. I mean, in this case, I wanted grunge music, mm -hmm. and I was living in Lincoln, Nebraska at the time, and somebody who ran a gallery there said his son played, and he came over and did really horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but horrible was fine. That's what you wanted, horrible in this situation. Well, I mean, he just played, he thrashed out 10 minutes of rather bad version of grunge music, and then I slowed the fuck out of it down, <laughs> and I flipped it, ran it backwards, and I did it against itself, and I composed the whole soundtrack out of this. I didn't give him credit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he, you know, I could have done the same thing. I play guitar, too. I don't happen to play grunge, but I, I could have tried and probably been as good if I listened to, you know, some. Yeah. You know. Well, there's one guy who used a, who used a 15, 16, he said, well, how did you get that beautiful bell? Well, it was a 1516s Craftsman wrench that I tuned down in frequency. Yeah. So he gets a church bell out of a wrench. You know? yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> Sound is a wonderful bell. Well, well computers, yes. computers are wonderful instruments. I've done a lot of messing around with old classical music, you know, just, but warping, you know, just, just very simple kind of, just slow it down, play it backwards, play it against itself, you know, and compose with, with that. The other nuts and bolts question, question was on the on the pullout when you had him slowly getting larger than the yeah. mm -hmm. which I was fantastic. I loved how slow it went. You didn't even notice it until it was already there, and you're like, right. "Whoa, he's he's bigger. He wasn't bigger." Right. You know, yeah. right. What I know earlier, you mentioned two different versions of after or of uh, Premiere Pro. Premiere. Is that still what you use? Or yeah, I use Premiere Pro. Yeah. Okay. I've always used. I mean, the first film I did it electronically was on an Avid, but that was 35 millimeter. And when Avid had just come out, but I, after that, I've always used Premiere Pro. I've got CS4. I don't considerable. It, it, when I initially got it, I, I, I was there were things about it I thought I didn't like, but I very quickly changed my mind. It has this nice thing where you can say, "I want to render this," and you dump it into Media Media like Media Composer. I forget. Anyway, so I, it, in effect, it's a separate program. So you say, "I want to render this timeline." You dump it over there, and then you go on and and, and continue editing. Yeah. Or you, Pull up the thing and still have Premiere, Premiere running, and the other the rendering of, of what you just had is autonomous from yeah. using it. We've got a strong enough computer you can do both at the same time. Right. So that was a big improvement because before it was like, okay, now I got to render if it's a long range for the feature length film. and say, okay, now my computer's tied up for the next day yeah. rendering this, and now it's not tied up for the next day. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a other things are are considerably better. Yeah, and, and CS4 is considerably like that too. CS5 wasn't as, as huge. Well, it was a bigger jump in Photoshop than yeah. it was in 
yeah. and Premiere and After Effects. Yeah. Did that? Did you use After Effects for that pullout, or was that in Premiere? No, that was all inside Premiere. In Premiere. Uh, I like that a lot. That's I'm just using the motion. Mm -hmm. Green screens shrink them slowly. Slow zoom them out. That's all. Yeah. Uh, just for a few other things. Um, on the, se the preceding scene where they just sit there silent, mm -hmm. uh, we shot. I, I did a retake on that because the first time they talked, and I felt like you know, act, I've had problems like this where they say, "Look, you don't need you, you're actors, but you don't have to talk to act, right? <laughs> Sometimes talk. You know, not, most actors feel like they're not doing anything if they're not wagging their mouths. So. So it's a little hard to get them to understand. Well, sometimes just not doing anything or you know not talking at least is very beneficial. And I think in this case you have this long, you know, people would say boring scene, but in fact it's it's building tension, right? silently built. You and how many parents can talk meaningfully to their children, especially if there's a really something really heavy going on. Very few, you know. The, this is a, a normal thing, this awkward silence of unable to say anything because you don't understand each other. So I wanted that. And then on the other one, just uh, the way I work, I basically, improvising like that, that was improvised. Uh, I mean, Ryan worked on it for five days, what he was going to do, but he didn't do it for me, he did it for him. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, the thing is you're going to, you're, you're coming back to your parents, and they're going to whatever with you. And so we did not rehearse it. It was like, okay, I got the camera set up, and uh, do it. I, if, he, if he'd blown it, then I think, but he didn't blow it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a very moving scene yeah. for most people. The lighting was the lighting of the room. I didn't light it. All I, did, I put a black cloth behind, behind the father, because I, I wanted the darkness. And I was conscious that I was um, basically anybody in the West has seen religious paintings and this echoes. The triptych is automatically you know, yeah. an altarpiece, and, yeah. and here you have the father and the mother and the, the son. Yeah. And the center thing, because of the lighting in his face, I deliberately underexposed a bit. And it looks very much like uh, some Spanish painters like Rivera. You know, very just baroque, and the rest of it, I sort of, you know, I was somewhat conscious, although I didn't put any lights around. It was just the light coming in the window. I just set them so the light fell on them this way, um, which at the most I know any professional would assume I lit it. Sure. So, well, obviously you lit this. And, well, I just use my eye with the light that's already there, yeah. <laughs> and uh, likewise the scene before in the living room. It's just. I pick places that have nice light, therefore you don't have to worry about that. You just yeah. say, okay, we have good light, and now we can just put it wherever we want. Yeah. So um, I think for this improvising, I have found for myself that, that rehearsing or doing it before is toxic. Hmm. And you have, to, you have to find some other way to get people where you thinking about what you want them to think about so they come up with things spontaneously and mm -hmm. give them a bracket. But if you start saying, okay, let's do a drug, you know, you see, if they don't, don't do it good the first time, the second time it'll be worse. Right. That's why a lot, like a lot of directors will say they shoot the rehearsals as well because you may yeah, get better stuff at the rehearsal than you get out of when they're actually acting. And I think, I think when you're improvising, it's even more likely because because they try to improvise what they just improvised, and then, then it's really then it you're trying to remember what, what they did before, and then it looks just like what it is. It looks like somebody trying to repeat what they think they did before. That's so when you set up a scene like that, do you just tell them kind of how it begins, and then it, it develops to the ending of the, the actors improvise, or do you say it begins here and it ends here, and what's in the middle is up to you? Well, it would depend on the which. Okay. I mean, I, I honestly don't remember on this one. I, re I do remember when, when he leaves, uh, when the son leaves, and the father was sitting there and I was gesticulating. <laughs> <laughs> go, go get up and follow him, right? Because he didn't know what to do. And you can, if you look at it and know that I did that, you can see him kind of picking up my, oh, my gesturing yeah. in his facial movements. 
some time that you've got up to yeah. So with when you've established skills this more like a, like in the cafe and stuff, you said at a certain point you know who your lead character and stuff yeah. is. So at a certain point do you say there's this scene and then this scene comes after that, or are you just going to this scene and then what happens? Well in this in, in making this film I don't remember knowing what the next scene would be. Oh, I would okay. shoot a scene and then and then <laughs> It would it lead, not just this, like the cafe scene right. does not lead didn't didn't lead to the next scene uh, <coughs> which I haven't shown you in this uh, ad copy or this advertising agency office. Uh, I I met a guy who was an advertising guy and he was willing to be in the film. I went and looked at this office and I said yeah. that's nice. Yeah. I'll set my other character. He'll be your I copywriter. Totally and so understand and that. so it was just like you know because. I mean, for most of my so-called career, which I don't think of it as a career, uh, you know, I never had any money, so it's basically finding what piece of reality will somebody allow me to, right. to co-opt. Say, so, okay, I can shoot in your office for free, right. good. You want to be in my movie? You have a nice face. Okay, you're a Vietnam vet? Oh, good, now I'll use you as a Vietnam vet, right? And so they don't have to step too far out of, right. out of their own life. And so I went to the scene, you know, then I made my next scene where I had a, had a copywriter who tells a story of picking a guy up and wanting advice about what should he do because he, you know, he's a Vietnam vet and he's got to get a rack with it. So he yeah. thinks there's some connective tissue. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then you say, okay, now we've got that. Okay, now we go to your, to the, uh, the next scene is in the ad copy writer's house where this guy is kind of abusing. I mean, basically, he's drinking his booze, he's not getting a job, the props is stealing things from him, and so it builds up to that thing where the guy finally attacks him because he's finally said, I can't trust you anymore. Yeah. And uh, so just one thing, there's only, I think, six scenes in the whole movie, which I, most of my films are equally simple. It'll be the six, eight scenes, and you don't need any more. I mean, you can make really heart-wrenching drama. I want to do one where there's one scene. Yeah. I'd like to make a film where there's, okay, there's one scene and that's all you really need. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it was just like building blocks and by the time I got to there, so I don't remember when I thought of this triptych. I, I think I probably said, okay, this can be your home, these are your parents. And then uh, I know that I thought of it before I set it up because I did bring three cameras. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and somehow I thought of doing that before, but I don't, and probably it was just the previous scene that finally triggered, yeah. okay, I wrap this up in this, yeah. this, this emotional scene. There's one more scene after, but it's a very simple scene where uh, the, 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 the lead character is sleeping under an overpass and he has a girl, a young a girlfriend now, yeah. and it's a kind of tender thing and she looks up. And then he ends up lifting his, he looks down at her and he lifts his face up and he looks straight at the viewer. And that was what I like. I, I, I wanted to confront the viewer, saying, "You, you are somewhat responsible for these people because we sent them off, yeah. and the problems they have when they come back is because we sent them off." Yeah. So, uh, but it's a very, very. I think it was five or six days shot, and as I say, you know, three hours this day, you know, yeah. right, just a few hours. So no big, not movie type. 12 hours a day, pressure, 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 somebody on your back. Instead, it's you on, you're, you're, I'm on my back about, I want to make a good movie. And, yeah. and th the real thing is just keeping the actors um, happy isn't the right word. Somehow guiding them to what you need. It's the same time they're guiding me, because I, you know, I didn't tell them what to say. I tell them, here's, here's what we're trying to make the film about, and if you think of appropriate things. And, I will edit while shooting if somebody, like for example, on, on the triptych, when, the, when he disappears, when this, his part goes black, which then let me bring in the parents' vigor, uh, when he left, it was because he said something totally inappropriate. And it was the way for me to edit, say, these kind of shots you cannot cut. It's, it's, you take it or leave it whole. But in that case, he had said something that was much too direct and obvious for, for what I was trying to do. And so I was able to cut that sound out, bring down the sound on the parents, and then bring it back up in sync with the parents back in there, and then it, he comes out. To me. But that, that was because you know, if he hadn't said something wrong, I wouldn't have done that, but, but he said something that was really like, 
we destroyed the scene if I'd left it, and there was a sneaky way for me to get in there and do a little bit of editing, yeah. though I couldn't edit once I saw it, right? Because right. I just dropped him out, dropped his sound, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, came back in. But all these little things you learn only by experience. Now I've done this, you know, I also shot films this way, which was different because the economy and stuff, but even with film, I got where I was very loose about improvising and finding the best. And did any of you see all the Bear Bears of New York? It's a, the 35 millimeter film, people think it's, you know, it's very, looks like a completely professional film in terms of being very beautiful, camera moves, everything. It isn't, it isn't structured like at all like what we're used to. It's much you know, Euro art house type sensibility to it. And uh, if you look at it, I don't think anybody ever thinks it wasn't scripted. I look at it and say, anybody who's actually done this knows full well it wasn't scripted because <laughs> you would never get performances like these with people knowing what they were going to say beforehand, mm -hmm. right? Because it's very natural and it's very, you know, things that you cannot, you know, there's why I have one scene in it where this man who's given a note to this girl in, a, in the museum, basically, he says, you know, can I can you see you later type note. And the two, he meets the woman and with her girlfriend, and they sort of get on his case. And we had worked out some of it, but it was improvised. And you get this magical performance, which I know the best actors in the world, if I trans made a transcript and said, now this is what you're going to do, you would never get a performance like what they did by rolling the dice and taking a chance to. Which, uh, fortunately, with digital, you know, it's, it's, you can do that. And it doesn't cost you, it costs you some time and energy. But one thing I did learn previously also we're doing in film is if it doesn't work the first time, drop it. Go find a new thing that you know, just start all over with a new thing, but don't try to get them to redo what they almost did right. right? If it doesn't have the magic the first time, it's not gonna have it the second time. But with digital, it's there because you're not really you're spending some time, you're spending some energy. But you can just drop it and say, okay, let's do another, and we didn't just blow 10,000 bucks, which would be the case in film. So in one way, it's very liberating. On the other hand, with me, my shooting ratio for at least narrative things hasn't really gone up from when I worked in film, which was usually two and a half to one in film. And most of my narrative stuff is around that ballpark, maybe sometimes. One of them was four to one. This one was probably, I didn't really keep track of it, but it's probably more like one and a half to one. I forget how long the film is, 76 minutes. I probably shot 100 minutes or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, so, any other thoughts, questions? I don't know what time it is, but when we're supposed to be out of here or whatever. 324-ish. I think I to watch. You guys filmmakers, I just... <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a problem. It's something at 3.30, I think. Yeah, yeah. six minutes. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you did start a little late, because they were yes, in your yes. already. Yeah. said yeah. everything's right. Yeah, yeah produ producers know what to uh, know watch the watches. Okay. You're not going to get that for another 10 minutes, because you might be... It know. was interesting. The, the cinematographer that was in here be between yours, yeah. And talking about how the reason that he likes so much things was because when you find that perfect light, yeah. then you know you're only going to have it for a few minutes. And the way you shoot, you do have it for your whole scene. Right. And the way he would shoot something, he wouldn't. So he's right. got to light it that way because they're going to go through it four or five times. And right. gonna well, he's working right. on an industrial scale, right. etc. Exactly. No, that's but. So I mean, my, my virtue is, the, is that I can move fast, because right? I don't have to fuck around with that, and I'm, I'm, the way I'm working with actors is like, okay, let's go. Like the scene I was mentioning in this, All the Bear Mirrors in New York, it's like a 10 minute long scene, and I went in a, I went in a, uh, it was a, it was a, a weird day, I won't tell you, explain all the whole weird day. I, I went into a, a, a restaurant I'd never been in before, because somebody had gone and s s sort of gotten permission to shoot in it, but I'd never been there, so I had to arrive there. And as soon as I arrived there, it was a, a, a November day, so the sun is moving fast, and there was some light bouncing off an apartment building opposite a park, just, you know, just off the windows and coming in. I really liked this light, 
So the actors arrived, and I said, you've got to do this fast because I don't want to lose that light. We have to do it in the next 15 minutes. And, you know, they had, the two actresses had kind of rehearsed their part together, where the, and, but the actor in it didn't know what they were going to do. And it was basically a French actress pretending she didn't speak English. And, and so that was what the, the two actresses cooked up. And I said, well, that's a good idea, but it'll be much better if something happens that breaks this and she blurts out something in English and gives away the, the, the trick. So they hadn't thought of that. So I told the actor, you have to say something that will provoke her. <laughs> and I told her, I said, well, he's going to say something. I don't know what it's going to be, but he's going to say something that should pop you out of this pretending you don't speak English or understand English. So he ended up saying, how many babies do you want? And I, None. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it worked like it was a, a very charming scene. And because it was in 35 millimeter and I had a 10 I had them go through a dry run of it just so they understood how long 10 minutes was. But I said, yeah, I don't want you to say the stuff you, you're going to say and I don't want you to do because it's all going to be a surprise. But I had to, and then while we were shooting, I was like, <laughs> and uh, when it got down to one, you got to wrap this up, guys, because yeah. I'm about ready to go out and film. It worked fine. And uh, those kinds of, uh, there's, I, it's, it's not really different than working, you know, it is different. Than, it, it's figuring out how to deal with actors. Right? And they're all different, so there's no rule. You know, some of them you can tell, I want you to do this, and some other, if you tell them, I want you to do this, you're lost, because right? you can't tell them that. They won't, you know, it's, it's like, so you have to get to know them well enough to say, well, this one I got to tell a lie to, this one I can just tell the truth that I want X, Y, or Z, and so on. Hey, kind of, in some, in some ways, the way you, the way you cast kind of reminded me of, of this one French director who, if, it, if there's a professional actor in the film, it's usually the lead, and sometimes not even the lead. Uh -huh. Basically, he, he doesn't use professional actors for the rest of the cast, and he, he picks people who are or do what the character is. Uh -huh. So they basically, you know, they basically don't have to learn anything. They're all playing themselves. Right. Well, who, who is that? I was trying to remember. Very much. I, I like professionals. It was against. this film that was all shot up in Calais. I think it was kind of like a murder mystery. And but it, you know, it was just the local town characters there, and they were all basically being themselves. Uh -huh. well, I, I use a lot of. Uh, That's the guy who directed High Fidelity with John Cusack. When he was talking about that, he he said casting is the most important part of his entire shoot. <coughs> Because he wants somebody that can be that character, not somebody uh -huh. that's pretending to be that character. Yeah. Well, for me, casting is usually 15 minutes over a beer. <laughs> Sometimes I want to see them act. I just want to be with them for a half hour and talk and see. If I like them, if I like them, then there, then I'll figure out how to make them act. Usually, I'm right. Some people, though, if you point a camera at them, they freeze up and mm -hmm. forget it. Yeah, we get them to quit doing it.